Hey Star Hunters, it's Orion Senshi. Welcome to today's video. Today is going to be part two of the Power Modifiers video that I started like, I think it was like two weeks ago. Everything has just been super hectic on my end. So, real sorry about that. Uh, I'm hoping that we can get back to a regular schedule at some point in the near future, okay? Alright, so uh, last time we stopped at Impervious and we're going to be jumping right in from there. Alright, ready? So last time I stopped at Impervious, now we're up to Increased Duration. This modifier adds one per rank to the power that it's modifying. And this uh, increases how long the ability lasts. Now, um, there are two ways that this is applied. One is when it's applied to Continuous Duration uh, Ability. Uh, sorry, when it's applied to instant duration abilities such as whenever you shoot a fireball or something like that and whenever increased duration means that you make it last longer so um, if you were apply this to a damage or some kind of instant effect then what that means is uh, every turn you would just take a standard action and then you'd say I'm using my standard action to keep concentrating on this instant duration effect that I have increased with this modifier and what that does is, uh, for instance, if you fire a fireball, it would be like if you're lighting the person on fire. So then, every turn, you spend a standard action and they make another toughness check. Um, now, you, you don't have to make another attack check. It just it, You're good as long as you spend your standard action. But as soon as you stop spending your standard action to do that, or you can't, then the effect ends, right? We... Now, um, when this is applied to something that has a sustained duration, which is um, something that normally would just take a free action to turn on or continue, it just becomes continuous where it's just always on. All right, so uh, jumping right along, now we get to increased mass. Now, increased mass is a flat one point per rank. This is a ranked modifier that for every point you put in there, it increases how big of a mass you can manipulate with this power, right? So, uh, this is usually applied to teleport, dimensional travel, uh, and stuff like that, where you can normally only carry 50 pounds of excess stuff besides what's already on your body. Uh, so, this increases the mass ranks that you can carry by one and remember every rank is just going to double the previous rank so the example they gave here is having increased mass three on teleport will allow you to carry up to 400 pounds because zero is 50 then one is a hundred two is 200 and then three is 400 remember every rank doubles okay now we get to increased range now this is actually uh, an interesting one because we use this a lot but we don't always know that we're using it. This is a one per rank modifier in which we take uh, something that is normally a personal close touch thing and we make it ranged. So whenever I say ranged damage, that is damage with the ranged modifier, right? Which is when you would go from using your fighting skill to determine if you hit to, deter to using your dexterity skill to determine if you hit, right? Now, there is a third level of this from, like, it's not just melee and ranged, there are uh, close and ranged, there is another one which costs two per rank instead of the one per rank, so that's two, not three, right? Which is when something becomes what's called a perception attack. That is an attack where you don't have to make an attack roll, they don't get a dodge check. If you can perceive them and you are aware your target exists, like it, it's hitting them. Now this is this is used a lot of times for like mind attacks, like, mm, uh, but it can be used for a variety of other things as well. Now keep in mind with perception attacks, there is a limit to ranks where you can only have as many ranks as your power level. Okay, because remember, if you're if you are not making an attack roll. Right? You can never have more ranks in the attack than your power level. If you are, that's when things get funky. 
incurable. This is a flat one point uh, add on modifier that is actually really funny. So I don't know about you, but my players don't normally have a lot of uh, regeneration or they don't normally have a healer because that for a lot of my players that's just not a fun thing it's not something they're inspired or really excited to do so I may have to have an NPC or then they just deal with it um, or I'll have them give them potions which are equipment that when they drink has a healing effect uh, which that's a whole nother thing now incurable means that damage or effects applied by an, an ability that has the incurable modifier cannot be healed off by any form of supernatural healing or regeneration that does not have the persistent extra which again which uh is a bit more expensive so this just means you use this like a, a, a poison dagger or a cursed thing where like the, the the cuts from this dagger don't uh you know don't heal super fast they you know they still have to wait for it to heal but again healing happens so quickly in mutants and masterminds that this isn't always as big a deal because you remember whenever you're resting in mutants and masterminds and you're at a point when your your gm says you're at rest for every minute that you're resting you heal off a damage condition or a damage so yeah indirect this this one this is a goofy one right so this is a flat one that can cost one to four points right and this means that the ability comes from a different point than you so you would use this if uh let's say you were creating a portal and you were throw like one portal near you one portal near your opponent and you were throwing a punch through the portal but the fist is coming out hitting your opponent from like behind them or something you use this to represent the attack coming or if you're calling down lightning or something like that and that is what like and this can allow for surprise attacks this can you know leave your opponent unable to get out of the way all of that stuff so indirect one means that the effect will always originate from a fixed point away from you so if you say call lightning down right that means that or no actually this would be like if you like had a, a thing where your energy blast would always come from five feet to your left right and every time you use that blast it will always come out of a portal five feet to your left indirect two which is when you spend two points on this is that it will you can either choose with indirect two to have the effect come from any point you pick the point whenever you activate it, right? It can be five feet to your left, above you, below you, whatever. Uh, and it's going to be firing away from you, right? So you can't have... With indirect two, you can't have the portal... Choose to have the portal appear behind your opponent and fire at you. Like, you know what I mean? If your opponent's in front of you. And then... You can also choose with indirect two to have the portal always appear at a fixed point, always shooting in a fixed direction, as long as that fixed direction is not firing away from you. So it gets a little bit weird here. Um, and then there's indirect three, which is the effect can come from any point going in a specific direction as long as it's not directly away from you. Or it can be from a specific point and it, uh, that will always fire out of that point and it can fire in any direction. You would use indirect 3 if, for instance, you had a drone that was part of your power set that would be what's actually firing off the blast, right? Um, also, you can use indirect 3 for fire coming up from the ground or lightning coming down from the sky. Generally, if whenever you're having up and downs you're going to use indirect three, okay? Um, I don't generally recommend one or two because they're just really limiting and for what you're doing, it just doesn't really feel really well. And then indirect four is it can, it can originate from any point and aim in any direction, including towards you. Uh, so you need indirect four 
in order to be able to consistently hit an enemy from behind without having to have some weird setup of this thing is I need to make sure that they are exactly 10 feet in front of me. So, um, indirect three or four are the ones that I feel personally are most worth it. In eight, flat one point. This is an effect that is just, it's a part of your character. It can't be turned off by nullify powers. Um, and it's just something that is truly a part of your character. Like, for instance, for giant robots, I will give them growth to represent them being bigger and while giving them in eight and permanent, which means that the growth is just, it's not a thing that is expanded. It is not a thing that's getting turned off. It is just stuck. Now, permanent is a flaw that we'll get to later. Permanent means it's always on and eight means no one can take it away with powers. And generally, if something's innate, that means that if you lose it for whatever reason, you should get a hero point. Insidious. Now, this one's also a bit of a goofy one. This is a flat one-point modifier. So, this is compared to the subtle modifier that, you'll, that we'll get to in a, uh, at some point, either this video or the next. And... Insidious is really funny because you, the enemy sees the attack happen, right? They see the effect, whatever it is, but they don't know that it, what it did. So, um, someone asked me what happens if I give Insidious to a gun, right? Then you shoot someone and they don't feel it at first. They think they're fine, right? And they think the bullet didn't hurt them. They think you're firing blanks or whatever. And they think that until the next time they get hit with an attack that is not insidious. And that's when they all of a sudden all the pain just hits them at once. And they're like, oh. They just don't notice. Uh, they need a, D a, a DC 20 skill check. Uh, usually perception or some other thing that might apply in order to notice. So, um, if you use Insidious on, let's say, uh, he gives an example of Weaken, where you're decreasing someone's strength. They won't notice their strength has been decreased until they go to try to lift something up or to use their super strength. So, that's, that's a goofy one. You can have a lot of fun with it. Linked. Oh, boy. Alright, I need to take a second to talk about the Linked Power. The link modifier. So, linked does not cost anything. Thank goodness. Because it's a pile of bags. Linked allows you to take two different powers and tie them together so they will always activate at the exact same time as part of the same action. You cannot link two powers that are of the same type. Like, you can't link two damage powers. You can link a damage and an affliction, which one of the most common examples, you have got a hero that throws a lightning bolt, right? And that lightning bolt in that line, in that 30 foot line, does a line area damage and a line area affliction. So then you link them together and that means that that hero, when he uses that power for one standard action, sets off both the affliction and the damage to everyone in the line. Now, um, if all of the things involved with this require an attack check or a dodge check, or like the same check, the enemy only gets one check for all of it. Right? Um, so, when you do this, the enemy gets, like I said, uh, for, the, for that example, they would get one dodge check to try to dodge the damage and the, uh, the affliction. They don't get two separate dodge checks. And if they fail, then they fail, right? Uh, or if it was an attack roll, right, where if he was throwing and he had to hit a specific target, that he would get one attack roll, right? And if they have the same resistance, if both things are hitting fortitude, right? Let's say the lightning's trying to overwhelm the body, so the damage is resistance to fortitude for some reason, and 
uh, electricity's resistance to fortitude as well for the affliction, they only get one fortitude roll that has to apply for both of them. Now, in order for this to work, right, all, all of the effects on the linked connected thing have to have the same range, and if they have different casting times, you will always use the longest casting time, right? Uh, but they all have to affect the same range, and you can't pick and choose and say, I'd like to only use the lightning damage and not the affliction, or only want to use the lightning affliction and not the damage because I don't want to supercharge an enemy that gains power from electric damage or something. Um, I Now, that is the basic example. There are a lot of other examples of using the linked power. Um, one of the things one of my players does is he has... Uh, a power where if someone goes gets sent flying in his direction, right? If someone were to grab an enemy and throw them in his direction, he has a reaction. He has a link power where both the uh, it's a leap and a damage, and both the leap and the damage are reaction speed, and they cue to the same thing that the enemy has to be thrown at them. And he just leaps into the air and lariats them midair and h- hits them for damage in midair. Which, that's, that's, that's goofy. Now, uh, in a linked power, the idea is that you're activating both of them as part of the same action, but they still resolve one at a time in the order that you determine. You, but you have to say, when you make the power, what's the order? It's leap, then swing, or swing, then leap. Um whenever it works like that and you don't get to pick and choose and swap the way it works after you've made the power okay now with that said right you can extra effort to power stunt to change the, the link power into something else with the cost of being fatigued the next turn some gms will say that you will actually go straight from fatigue to exhausted because you're modifying two powers that's between you and your gm I want to take a minute to talk about linked because it's a big, complicated thing, and it doesn't actually um, change any of the. Uh, it doesn't change the cost of any of the uh, linked powers. Okay. Uh, I don't think I missed anything there. Yeah, I don't think so. No? Okay, moving on. Multi-attack. Someone actually asked about this in the comments in one of my other videos. So, this is an interesting one. I'm not entirely sure how I feel about it, honestly. Um, But, multi-attack costs one per rank. Uh, This is something that's going to be put onto a, a, usually a damage or some kind of an attack, right? And there are three ways you can use it. The first is... If you're uh, firing multiple times at a single target. When you do this, you do everything normal, right? You roll, there's no penalties added, nothing, right? But instead of it being a question of did you hit or did you not hit, it becomes by how much did you hit, right? If you hit by and you got two degrees of success, right? Two. So that is between five and nine right of degrees of success then you will add plus two to your damage because it's like you're hitting them multiple times right if you hit it three or more times so that is you beat it by ten or more right you will uh, add five to the damage which, that's pretty good. And that allows you to go past the power level limits, which is really, really good. Now, here's the other thing. Impervious toughness is not affected by multi-attack when you're firing multiple times at the same target unless your GM says so or there's some extenuating circumstances. So, this means that, like... If, for whatever reason, let's say you're, you're fighting an enemy who has impervious toughness 9. 
So then that would round up to be they can ignore everything five damage or less, and you're firing a standard rifle with uh, you know a standard uh, full auto rifle that is going to do five damage plus multi attack. No matter how many times you hit, right? Doesn't matter how high you beat it, and you you cannot get that five to hit because shooting the sa- shooting multiple times isn't going to get through something that's just going to ignore one bullet. Now, GMs may rule this differently. Your mileage may vary, okay? Now, then there is multiple targets. You can choose to hit multiple targets. Oh, by the way, also multi-attack can't, it is not just a damage. It is also used for anything that applies an attack roll, so it can be used for afflictions as well and will modify the affliction DC as well by two and by five, exactly the same way. I just said attacks because that's how it's most commonly used. All right. Now, mul- uh, hitting multiple targets is you just choose any number of targets. You, ch- you Any number of targets that are within range of this attack and you make separate attack rolls for each of them. But each attack roll gets a modifier, gets a penalty equal to the number of targets so if you're hitting two targets then both targets will have minus two if you're hitting five targets then all five targets will have a minus five to the attack roll to the on hits the damage rolls still resolve the same and it's individual damage for each one now here's where things get a little bit weird this is the third one that is that I have actually never seen used in gameplay outside of testing purposes. And this is the covering attack. And so you pick an ally that is within range that uh, isn't like in close combat range with someone, right? And you try to give them cover from a certain number of enemies that you can see that are in range of you, right? And you just say, I'm giving them the benefits of cover. And it's at GM discretion, whether it's full or partial cover, right? And you're just essentially spraying at the enemies wildly to have the enemies keep their heads down so your friend can get out of danger, right? The enemy can choose to ignore your cover, at which point you get a free attack roll. On anyone who chooses to ignore it right um, and there's no penalties there's, there's it's not like you know a minus for each target it's it's just a little bit weird honestly uh, it can be useful but I haven't seen anyone really use it you would mainly use it to cover like a civilian you're trying to get out of a dangerous situation penetrating one point per rank flat this is a rank thing. Now, you cannot have more ranks in penetrating than the actual attack can do damage. Um, this isn't just a damage. This is also, you can give penetrating to anything that, like, any kind of thing, whether it be an affliction, uh, damage. Penetrating just means you're able to overcome impervious resistance. Most commonly, impervious resistance is used on toughness to resist damage, which is why I normally associate it with damage. Now, if you hit someone, and normally their impervious resistance means that your attack would not hit, so they don't even roll the toughness check, right? If you have penetrating, they have to roll the toughness check against your penetrating ranks. So if it's an attack that does damage 7 and you have penetrating 5 and your opponent has impervious toughness 14, then they would ignore the 7, but they still have to roll against that 5, which your mileage may vary. I'm a little frustrated with how penetrating pans out. And in some settings... GMs allow impervious toughness to be uh, one point. Like it will be a one for one thing where if you have one rank of impervious toughness, you ignore one damage. And in those settings, penetrating gets more valuable. It's this, it's this connected thing where essentially the more effective your GM makes impervious toughness or impervious as a 
you know, as a modifier, the more effective penetrating becomes. I do use penetrating for certain uh, minions or grunts to represent having armor piercing ammunition, especially if my players have impervious toughness that would let them ignore certain situations. It, or it is to uh, designate stronger, higher power enemies. Precise. This is a flat one point modifier. And this means that you can do things with this power that require uh, a lot of delicacy or fine control, as it says here. Now, what you do with this is up to the GM. And I would say talk to your GM before you take it. I let my players be very liberal with things that they have precise. I have a house rule that if you are trying to aim your attack, not just at an enemy, but at a specific part of the enemy's body, I apply a penalty, a circumstance penalty. Uh, minus two if you're aiming for a general part of the body, like you're aiming for the arm or you're aiming for uh, the head or something. And I usually will apply a minus five if you're aiming for a super specific part of the body, like trying to knock a tooth out of their mouth or hit a ring off of their finger. Because that's just really intense. And I feel like that goes a lot smoother in my games than you roll an attack roll and the enemy, and if you hit, then you have to roll again, and then the enemy gets a dodge save to try to get out of the way, to get their hand out of the way. And I just find that just adding that penalty helps. Anyway, uh, if... A player has precise on their attack then I will as my as per my house rule let them forego the minus two penalty uh, and then the minus five would be downgraded to a minus two so that's that's how I like to use precise it can also be used to like use something like it says move object to pick a lock um and uh, Talk to your GM. This is a really great flavor modifier. Reach. Arguably one of the most useless modifiers of all time. This is a flat one point per rank. So it is a ranked modifier where you choose how many ranks you want to put on it. Each rank costs one. This is supposed to be used to modify close range attacks in order to represent uh, like a spear or a whip or something having more than five foot reach every one rank increases your reach by five feet why do I say that this is the most useless modifier of all time because elongation exists elongation is a power that lets you stretch a portion of your body and I think it's like 15 feet per rank that you get off of elongation. I still like being able to just do this. Pop this open. And... Yep. Uh, so elongation stretches 15 feet for one rank, 30 feet for two, and then it just keeps doubling after that like everything else. And... You're probably wondering, well, how does that fit in with this? Remember when I talked about linked powers? You can put elongation linked to a close range attack in order to represent the attack, like the spear stretching or something to have a really long reach. Now, it's up to your GM how much they're going to let you get away with that. If they feel that that's overpowered or if they feel that elongation doesn't suit what your power is supposed to be or what your character can do, um, then you would do something like reach. Um, I guess with elongation, you could alternatively give it like a permanent and innate modifier and say that the thing is just in like always that long and then you have to deal with having a really, really, really long spear. <laughs> but, yeah, there's that. Reaction. Oh, buddy, old pal. So, 
you have the there are the different actions in a turn from mutants and masterminds. You have standard, free, uh well, there aren't normally things that cost move actions, right? And what reaction does is let you take in a power that would normally be a standard or free action, right? And you can instead use it as a reaction in reaction to a specific event during an opponent's turn. And remember, you have an infinite number of reactions as long as you hit the triggering event. So this costs either one per rank or three per rank. And it is not ranks of reaction, it is ranks of the power. So this can get super expensive. It costs one per rank if you were, ta if you were turning a free action power into a reaction. It costs three per rank if you are turning a standard action power into a reaction. Most commonly, I see this used for reaction damage for auras around people that if someone touches them, they just instantly take damage. Uh, and then they just go, it's a four, uh, four cost per rank thing that is the sh normally how I see that used. So, it is a, it's a powerful thing. GMs be very wary of letting your players take too many reactions because depending on what they set as a reaction, just having that extra action economy can get pretty nutty. I told you one of my players, he has a thing where uh, he creates a duplicate of himself and the duplicate copies his power and he has the power that if someone gets thrown at him, he can reaction, jump, and hit the person out of the air. So then he does a thing, because he has super strength in that form, where he will grab someone and then throw them, and then his duplicate will jump in the air and do the thing to lariat them out of midair. Which, that's cool, it's a great, exciting special attack, and it's really expensive, and it's at the core of what that character does. And you know what, that's fine, you know, the whole thing with working in tandem. But... It can be it can be game breaking. Um, I had a villain who had a thing, a reaction that a, a reaction affliction where he would punch people and incapacitate them whenever they got into or left his melee range. And with a team of mostly melee players, that got really rough really fast. I had a player who just got wrecked. He ran in, got punched, and it was a cumulative effect. It went uh, like. I think it was dazed, stunned, incapacitated, and he and it had cumulative, and then he got stunned when he ran in, and then on the next turn, uh, he tried to run away, and it triggered again, and then he got incapacitated right off the bat. And I mean, that's a bad guy, so he's going to have a lot of points to play with, but be wary of how that gets used in your games. Okay. Reversible. Flat one point. A reversible power, a reversible modifier when it's put on a power, then you can reverse the effects of the power. You can, as a free action, go boom, this turns off. Everything I just did turns off. Uh, common use of this is for people who don't like to actually kill or don't like to do a lot of damage. They will have this modifier on their attacks. So that way, as soon as they get what they want, as soon as they achieve their objective, they snap their fingers and uh, they just instantly heal everyone. So that way they don't leave, you know, don't leave maimed and injured and dead people all over the floor. It's up to the GM where, at what point things stop being reversible. Um, because... If someone's like it's one thing if you heal the wound it's an like if you heal a bullet hole from someone who's dying it's another thing if their soul has left their body and they're dead you again your mileage may vary talk to your GM you know there there may be a point at which too much damage has been done or maybe it's uh, you can only reverse the last instance of things that you did and you can't reverse all of it. it it can be quite fun but make sure you know what you're working with here and uh reversible was a flat one point ricochet this is one point per rank flat so this is a ranked one you pick how many ranks you want in it this is funny 
Ricochet is primarily used for ranged attacks. Um, and what this does is for every rank you have in Ricochet, the attack that it's modifying can hit that many surfaces before it hits the target and resolves its actual effect. Now, it does no damage to the people it ricochets off of. So I had a player who had a sniper rifle with, like, ricochet 3, in which his, he could have his bullet ricochet off of people's helmets to get to his target. It does no damage to the helmets it ricochets off of. Why would you do it then? The idea is to get around enemy defenses for the chance of getting a surprise attack to do the surprise attack maneuver. Uh, or to use it to strike down, uh, like if your opponent has a huge front-facing shield, you ricochet hit them behind, hit from, hit them from behind. One of my players has a power in which he has a rapier that gives him impervious toughness to all attacks that come from the front. Anything could be an AOE attack as long as the uh, origin point is in front of him, right? Um, I don't think he watches my videos, so he probably doesn't know this, but there will be villains that have ricochet powers on their rifles that will shoot and have the bullets come uh, hit a wall and ricochet, hitting him from behind, completely bypassing that power. And because he sunk all of that, he doesn't have very much toughness. Because why should he? He's got impervious. Um, or other people will be disarming him because it's an easily removable rapier. But, you know, that's a whole other conversation. Again, your mileage may vary. Uh, it's up to you and the GM how many bounces it takes for something to be considered surprise. What the situation that would allow it to be surprise. Um, or, you know, if you may have to make other checks. Secondary effect. Uh, this is a one per rank ability that is amazing. <laughs> okay. All right. I say it's amazing because I love it. Um, I enjoy putting this modifier on melee attacks that are in the same array as range attacks. Because then it makes the melee attack cost two per rank. It is the same as the range attack, which helps with using up points. And it's kind of a twofer. So... Whenever you hit a target that has the secondary effect modifier, with, with an attack that has secondary effect modifier, you resolve the first one completely normally, right? Um, and so this is, like, whether it be an affliction or damage, you resolve it completely normally the first time. And then there's something that happens, whether it be a portion of your energy goes inside of them to explode again, or they get coated with something that's on fire, or whatever, and then at the end of your next turn, you, the person who, who fired the attack, it will go off again, and you don't have to make another attack roll, they just have to make a resistance check. So, I have a player who does this, that, I, I keep referencing my players a lot, but I mean, what do you want from me? Uh, who... He has a thing where he does this melee attack that he charges up with cosmic energy and he hits his target the first time and then a piece of his energy goes inside the target to explode inside of them for the secondary effect on the next turn. But, limiting factor here. If you hit someone with an ability that has a secondary effect, then on your next turn, during your turn, you hit them with that same ability, exact same ability, then the secondary effect will not detonate during the end of the turn. It will push this, it will delay the activation of the secondary effect. It's like you put the pin back in the grenade for a couple more seconds, or six more seconds, as it were, until the next turn. So, what you would want to do when you're using secondary effect is you hit an enemy with an ability that has a secondary effect. And then you won't, uh, on the next turn, you either hit a different enemy or you hit uh, hit them with a different attack. Could be could be a different attack with that also has secondary effect, but it just cannot be the same attack. And again, this goes for damage and afflictions. Selective. This is a one per rank uh, uh, modifier that is actually really useful. So selective means. Whenever you're using an area of effect ability, 
Um, you can uh, you can choose who gets affected by it. It's just it's really simple. Uh, no, this no actually can this be used for things other than area effect? I'm not sure what you do with this for things besides area of effect abilities, but it just means you can be super selective of who gets affected and who doesn't. Um, yeah, yeah, it says... Uh, use the precise modifier if you need something more specific than just picking who's, uh, who's available. Well, who gets, the, who gets affected and who doesn't. Okay. Sleep. This is a zero cost modifier. Uh, when this modifier is applied to an effect, basically, if you would incapacitate your target, you do not incapacitate them, you put them to sleep. This is zero cost because whether they're incapacitated or they're asleep, they're still out of the fight. So it doesn't do anything. Most uh, Since this is a point by system, pretty much everything in the system is geared towards combat. Uh, so some people do different things with sleep. If you have a character with the power to enter people's dreams, then maybe they would have a gun with bullets that put the enemy to sleep, or you would have a party member that would get special ammo that would put someone to sleep, or, you know, it just, if you would incapacitate them, they just go straight out. Split. This is... One that I enjoy that I think is designed a lot better than multi-attack. It's essentially multi-attack, but it's a lot cheaper and I feel a lot simpler to understand. Okay? So this is a flat one point per rank modifier. You choose how many ranks you want in split. Whenever you use an ability, whether it be an attack or an affliction that has split, you can split the ability and you can split it as many times as you have ranks in the split. But you do not apply the full ranks of the ability to each target. You have to split the ranks. Uh, the example they give here is if you're using a rank 10 effect and it has split one, so then you can split it between, you can split it one time so it goes to two things. You can choose to have five ranks go here, five ranks go there, four ranks, six, two, or eight, as you see fit. Now, the on hit for each of these, because you do roll two different on hits, right? Um, oh, actually, no. That's funny. I take that back. Edit this part. So split, it has this thing where, whereas with multi-attack, you make separate attack rolls, and each attack roll has a penalty for how many targets you're hitting. Split, you instead put that cost on the effects of the power, where the effect of the power is split between the two targets. And you only make one attack roll, and you compare that one attack roll to, the, uh, to everyone. And so if you crit on that attack roll, like, or if you get, uh, you know, if you get, you know, a, a power modifier where you like power attack or accurate attack or all out attack, that's going to be used to modify for everything. Okay. And also remember, you cannot have more ranks in split than you have ranks in the power. Be, I'm not sure why you'd want to, because... Again, you need to, when you split, you have to allocate at least one rank towards every target. We're almost to the end here. Subtle. This is a flat one to two point. You pick one point or two points. A subtle effect is hard to see. This is like a hidden blade you pull out of nowhere, or when you punch so fast that no one can see it, or you throw a knife so fast that the, that the naked eye can't see it. A one point subtle modifier makes whatever that ability is so fast or hard to notice that uh, someone needs to succeed a perception check of 20 in order to notice it. 
um, or they meet or they may need certain kinds of supernatural senses to even be aware of its existence, right? Subtle two for only two points means that ability is completely undetectable. I don't care what powers you have. Like, if someone sees your subtle two ability happening, you should get a hero point. No questions asked. That is, like, that means you are up against some really intense stuff. Now, what would you do with a subtle ability? Basic answer, you make a surprise attack maneuver where, you're, where you can have make an attack on an enemy that's going to have halved... Uh, dodge and parry or you would use it to get something to, to use a power in a way that no one's going to see it so you can do something out of the sight of the villain um, or to sneak something past so there's a variety of uses of subtle just whatever is modified by the subtle modifier is not visible sustained so this one is interesting it's a zero cause it's a free modifier right and some people in the community don't like it i personally really like it um and it's it's one of those ones it's one of those modifiers that's more for flavor it has some combat uses but some people feel like the flavor is not worth the trade-off so sustained is something that you apply to a permanent effect like for instance if you apply sustained to protection, protection is permanent, and as part of the protection modifier, your uh, toughness is permanently going up by a certain amount. Sustained means you have to turn it on. It's not always on, and when you turn it on, you have to spend a free action every turn to keep it on. But if you get stunned if you if you if something happens and you cannot spend free actions right or you choose not to spend the free action then it turns off now this is an important thing to remember now i generally just assume after my player tells me they turn on xyz thing i presume it's going to stay on until they have to turn it off or they tell me that they turn it off or I'll ask them, are you turning this off? I'm not going to be that guy to be like, okay, it's your turn. Are you going to spend your free action to keep your force field on? Because that's just that's just a jerk thing. Uh, force field is the commonly uh, referred to name for a sustained protection ability. So you're probably wondering, well, if it doesn't make it any cheaper, why would I do a thing where my powers could be turned off? Um, this, because it essentially removes the permanent modifier to from the ability that means that the power can also be turned off via nullifies well because since it's not a permanent modifier or since it's not a permanent power you can use extra effort on it <laughs> normally the only thing you can extra effort that would be permanent would be adding one rank to your strength and adding one rank to uh adding one rank to your strength and adding one rank to your speed that's normally all you could actually extra effort without it being some kind of a thing you could turn on or off sustain means that you can extra effort to power stunt it to do any number of kinds of things right and this gives you a lot of freedom like i love the uh the characters where they've got a really big and powerful force field right and that's pretty much their main power they can turn it on, they turn it off, but it has all of these extra effects where they can, let's say they shape the force field into a dagger, right? Or, or into a sword that they could use. Or maybe they shape, they, they use the force field to, uh, they extend it instead of it have it being on their body to turn into a big bubble that they're creating that's getting between them and their target, uh, between them and their enemy, right? Or maybe they use the force field to fly because they, they power stunt it into a thing to uh, just propel them backward, or propel them forward, right? Or I guess you'd probably use that for a leap, but you see what I'm saying. So it's kind of a thematic thing, but if you have something that has the sustained modifier, you can, in the heat of the moment, extra effort to power stunt and change it into something else. So that is a thing you can do with sustain. Some people feel like it is not worth it, and 
talk to your GM, find out what he'll let you do with sustained, find out if you're, if you, if you're going to get hard punished for choosing sustained. Wee. Triggered. Triggered is a flat one point per rank. Remember when we talked about reaction and how reaction was really expensive? It was either one per rank or it was a three per rank and it got really expensive and you just said for your reaction, uh, you said, when X thing happens, I, I have the option to always do Y thing, right? When someone touches me, if this power is on, they will get electrocuted during their turn as a reaction, right? Triggered works slightly like that, um, except triggered, you have to, one, see the thing happen, right? And two, you have a set number of times that you can use a triggered ability, which is why it's so much cheaper. It's a flat, you know, one, you choose how many ranks you want in triggered, and for every rank in triggered, that is how many times you can reaction speed activate that ability before the ability just turns off. And it's up to your GM how long it's cho how long till that thing recharges. Usually, it's at least an hour till till you get your uh, trigger uses back, right? Um, and you can also even further modify it uh, by. Uh, giving it variable to in order to let you choose the trigger every time, like every time you set it. Normally, as soon as you take the power, um, the trigger can't be changed, but you need the variable modifier in order to change it. Speaking of variable, dun -dun -dun, this is the last one of the power modifiers before we get to the flaws. So let's talk about variable for a second. It is a flat one to two point modifier. This lets you change your descriptors. Now, descriptors are completely free. Like, when I say descriptors, I mean bludgeoning, piercing, slashing, fire, light, water, holy, antimatter. All of that is completely free. Having one descriptor doesn't is normally not much better than any other, except for in specific situations where enemies have specific weaknesses. Most of the time, it's just there's some presumption of what you have as your modifier. Every ability, every attack, everything has some descriptor, right? Variable lets you, once per turn, as a free action, change the modifier of, or change the descriptor of the power in which variable is modifying. So, for one point, for one rank of variable descriptor, you can choose from a, from a commonly held group of things, right? Like, um, if it's, uh, like, you can choose between different types of, uh, like, is it electromagnetic? Is it, uh, hot and cold? Is it weather? So you can just modify it that way, right? I normally don't like variable one because I feel like it's super limiting. Um, like you can like. Okay, hold on. Let me get a better example here. Uh, let's say, uh, you have a power that is lightning based, right? It's a lightning damage thing, and with variable one, you can instead say, okay, variable one weather, right? So, it's, maybe it's not lightning, maybe it's wind, maybe it's ice, because, you know, sleet and hail and rain, right? Maybe it's, you know, uh, I, I don't know, uh, you know, again, water for rain. The idea is, one rank means it all has to be in a group of things that you can choose, and talk to your GM from the list of things you can choose from, Right? And then two ranks in variable is you can pick from a broad group, right? Like, for instance, if you have variable to magical, right? That means you can pick any magic descriptor you want. Is this magical fire? Is this magical ice? 
Uh, is this dark magic? Is this light magic? Um, you know, or is this technological? Like, if, you know, you talk to your GM. I personally feel like if you're going to take variable, just take two points. That is my personal belief, my personal feeling on it, but that's me. But yeah, so this has been all of the generic modifiers for uh, powers that uh, increase their effectiveness. Um, I'm going to edit this, get this back up, and all that stuff. Sorry if my head was moving around. I was going through stuff, and this is weird because I'm sitting on the floor, and I have my computer actually on a chair because I'm at my friend's place because that's where I'm living now, and his computer is back there and doesn't have a camera on it, so I can't record on it. Also, I shaved. Got the baby face now. Uh, I'm still trying to get back in the mood and in the, in the rhythm of getting more and more videos up. I'm hoping to have more stuff coming up here soon. Uh, I still have to do the 100 subscriber special now that I've broken 100. Yay! And I'm probably going to be getting back to streaming some point within the next one to two weeks. Um, I'm thinking I might be doing a video on a double feature on a couple books uh, as the 100 subscriber special because people have asked for it and I want to give my ups and downs and thoughts on some of these books. And all of that stuff so look forward to that as we're just moving forward into the future and always always remember the motto shoot for the stars have wonderful adventures live your dreams and always 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 enjoy you some memes have a good one.